For many, Eliza Carthy is at the forefront of a revival in English traditional music. Part of a legendary musical dynasty, Eliza has been on the road since her teens, mixing genres as disparate as musical, tango and even drum and bass. Twice nominated for the Mercury Music Prize, Eliza has brought this kind of music to a new generation. To take something that everyone's familiar with and to suddenly give it another depth, another, another uh, powerful uh, sensibility, that really, I think that's a great strength. The way that she performs, you really are able to kind of see through her to the music and the words. The song is always kind of bigger than the singer. A lot of the older folk bands tend to kind of concentrate on the playing. Fair enough, you know. I mean, and it looks—it's like, not like a classical recital, but it has. Uh, you know, you, you listen to the music, and that's all you get. It. Whereas Eliza, it just looked like it kind of was a physical thing that had taken her over. Are they pop songs or are they folk songs because of where she comes from? Um, I think she would tell you they're part of the same thing. Each generation has their own influences. It's how tradition goes on, it's how it marches on. The music itself, you can do whatever you want with it. It doesn't mind, it's very forgiving. Norma was, was, uh, was singing up until two weeks before Eliza was born. All that racket going on upstairs, he doomed always to be a musician. You know, what a musician too. Eliza is recording her new album at her home in the Scottish Borders, 20 miles south of Edinburgh. We started making this album in 2002. Um, I was signed to Warner Brothers for um, about three years and basically hadn't really thought about making a songwriting album before that point, just because I'd been working with the traditional material. Eliza's music relies on the freedom to experiment with musical styles. When she's not on the road, the calm of her remote home gives her the space to write new material. There's a really strong musical community out here. You know, it's all people like us. There's just music all around here. The guy that fixes our boiler plate on the album, you know, is an amazing jazz bass player, Tom Line. <laughs> he came, he, you know, comes by, checks on the central heating, and then just bangs a few tracks down for us. On the dark streets of a winter city, he showed me his big look to my face. By the time spring came, I was still right and pretty. And there was another big girl in my place. 
It's kind of been a little bit of a, a not very well kept secret that we've been writing this album for like six years. Just, you know, it's gone through lots and lots of different incarnations, but it's always been called the same thing. Dreams of Breathing Underwater, her new album, is partly about Eliza's time with a major record label. I really don't belong on a major label at all. And I totally signed to a major label right at the time when everybody was just starting their little cottage industries and everything. It's nice to be back with Topic Records again. It's nice to be back with an indie again and everything. And yeah, self-determination rocks. Eliza Carthy has returned to her home in the Borders to record a new album of original songs. Much of Eliza's work is firmly rooted in English traditional music. For her, ensuring the survival of this tradition is not a passive process. It's a strange idea to imagine that Englishness could just be one thing. It really isn't. It's, it's multifaceted and that's, that's what I love about it. In the 60s with uh, the British folk revival, there was a moment where people tried to set it in stone and say, this is what folk music is, and to kind of preserve it. And Ewan McCall had this thing where you couldn't sing a Scottish song if you were English, and you couldn't sing an English song if you were Welsh. I think it was an attempt to kind of freeze it. And in a way, that's understandable, because at that moment in time, there was, you know, amplified rock and roll happening and a massive kind of cross-cultural exchange all over the world. But it's kind of unnatural. And I think what um, it's unnatural to say this is what this is, and, we, and we, we stop it at this point. For anybody who knows and understands folk music, it's kind of a constantly evolving thing. Um, not only with new music that's produced, but with new arrangements and kind of you know the archaeological digs of finding old tunes and putting your own arrangements on them and taking it forward. I want to be able to watch the X Factor and go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And then I want to be able to go to Sheffield and sing Christmas carols with 200 other people in a pub, you know, and know that that's it's part of the same thing. While the Scottish, Irish and Welsh held on to their national identities, the creation of the British Empire had a complicated effect on what it meant to be English. English folk music had to fight quite a difficult corner because I think that um, during the 80s, kind of folk music came to mean kind of Celtic music and that meant a very specific Irish sort of music. Um, also, all the cultures that we oppressed, right? <laughs> the, the Scots, the Irish, whatever, the music becomes really a, a definite part of their identity that they have to hold on to because their identity is being taken away from them. Whereas I think because the English as a race were always kind of able to reach out to other places and take what they wanted, there wasn't as much at stake in defending our identity. And I think music is tied up with identity. But you, ha but you have to be really careful about that because the English identity changes and evolves. It's always been a country where lots of different cultures have passed through. And I think what's been really good about Eliza's music is she is able to take on board the different uh, influences that have come over. It's much more like a Billy Bragg idea of what a national music should be than it is a Tory party political conference soundtrack. I think it's artists like Eliza who've kind of, you know, got all that kind of folk credibility but want to do something with it and take that knowledge and meld it with other people's knowledge that, that, that's quite fascinating. I think she has great respect for the tradition, but also a healthy disrespect for it too.
Eliza's healthy disrespect resulted in her 1998 album Red Rice, which contained a mixture of sampled beats and drum and bass rhythms. The folk establishment was outraged. It was a... Uh... Quite an interesting time, because it's always difficult to know how the hardcore folkies are going to take it. But, you know, it's bringing it to new eras and new generations, really. I was trying so many different things with, with the traditional material. I was using the traditional material as a template and then just trying loads of different stuff with that, different lineups, different sounds, acoustic stuff, uh, really organic stuff, and using sample beats. I've tried all of these different things with traditional material and, um, and it just gives you ideas, you know. When she uses a program beat, it's only appropriate in the same as using clog dancing for a rhythm was. It doesn't feel like they're desperate attempts to, to appeal. We would try and do what came naturally, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a case of, of trying to, to shoehorn a ballad into a four, into a you know like a four by four type of a beat or anything like that. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was just we would, I mean, we would sit and we would think about what came naturally, and then we would build these arrangements around, around that. And, and I got my material from all over the place. I still, I still do. Right, we've got a song by Brilly Bragg for you now. Br Brilly Bragg. That was easy for me to say. This. Um... <laughs> I don't really know what this is about. It's kind of a love song, and I did ask him, and he said it, it was about humanity, <laughs> which doesn't ne really narrow it down. Eliza took a not a throwaway song, but a song that's perhaps most memorable for its opening line. You know, he was trapped in a haircut; he no longer believed him. You know, I mean, which is a great, a lovely line, isn't it? And I'm very, very proud of it. But I wouldn't say it's one song that people are always asking me to, to play, apart from uh, uh, people with bad haircuts. Uh, and, um, and, and she picked it up and, and, and took it to another place. He was trapped in a court he no longer believed in. She says, I'm a teacher here. I teach the children And he wondered to himself There and then All the things he could learn from her The great mighty wonder I think Eliza was born and brought up near Robin Hood's Bay, North Yorkshire, 
It's a place he still calls home and comes back to whenever possible. I do love being here. It's, it's, it's very important. This house especially is a real hub for everybody. I've, I've been on the road for more than half my life now. I don't get tired of it when it all works right, but I can't mess around with it anymore. I'm not just like, I can't just fling my clothes in a suitcase and, and be away from anywhere safe for, for six months without it, without it really affecting me these days. Sometimes it's just nice to come home and have a cuddle from your mum, you know? <laughs> Eliza's dad, Martin Carthy, has been a figurehead of the English folk scene for over 40 years. He has influenced some of the great American songwriters like Bob Dylan and Paul Simon. Martin was part of that generation who learned all the Lonnie Donegan songs, which were basically old folk songs. And when Lennon and McCartney went off to, to follow Chuck Berry, Carthy stayed true to the folk aspect and followed off the folk tradition to become the, the definitive English 60s revival folk singer and guitar player. You know, I had a conversation once with Johnny Marr where he, he said to me, all my guitar licks are just Martin Carthy sped up. I told, I told Martin this next time I saw him, he said, oh, that's great. Who's Johnny Marr? Martin was honoured for his virtuoso playing and tunings by having a special signature instrument designed for him by the American guitar maker C.F. Martin. In 1998, the Queen got into folk music too and gave him an MBE. The guitar he's playing here is a tailor-made copy of his original and much-loved first Martin. I bought a Martin guitar in 1963 and I bought it for 60 guineas. I'd just done a, my first ever television show and had some money in the bank. And um, I went into, went into Sound City with my brand new checkbook and said, have you got a round hole acoustic guitar second hand? And the guy handed me this Martin 0018. And I sat down and this guitar just snuggled into me. Instruments talk to you, they tell you, if they like you and if you're gonna like them and I must have sat and played for about 45 minutes, just playing this guitar. And I sat up and I said, I really want to buy this, but I haven't got enough money. And he said, write me two checks. I had that guitar for 39 years. I did every, every, just about every gig, just about every gig I did. blame Liza for this and I'm sure it, I'm gonna blame her. I've always given Liza credit for this because she said in various interviews he's got this lovely lovely old guitar won't somebody please buy him a new one <laughs> because it was so hard to tune sometimes it's the old original still a lovely guitar Like Martin's guitars, Eliza's instruments are the tools of her trade. Tim Phillips has made her fiddles since she was 17. When I first uh, met Liza was about two years after I started violin making, and I was doing a festival in Newtown here, a local um, folk festival, and Eliza turned up on my stand, she was about 17, and Eliza really took a fancy to one of my fiddles. And I just felt, whoa, this could be good, Tim, because I, I, you know, I was, only in my second year, I just had a couple of fiddles which were sort of acceptable, and I felt there was, you know, it was important really to see if I could get Liza playing one of my fiddles. She really loved it, but she didn't have any money. We came to an agreement that Eliza would buy the fiddle from me for a pound. It was really good because it meant I could say to all these people coming up to me saying, Hey, Tim, have you sold a fiddle yet? I could say, Yes, I've sold one to Eliza. And she could say to people, look, I've bought a fiddle from Tim. She performed with it later that day on stage at Newtown, and that was the first time that one of my fiddles had been on stage being used. That was really thrilling. So that's how it happened. And after that, then, she bought a number of other ones and has used them ever since. I have this one. I have um, a round-bodied one, which has no corners on it. 
Um, and I also have um, an octave violin, which is like a violin, but an octave below. Marianne Faithful sings a song about a boy who's like the rain. And lo, that's you. When you first appeared, you brought me flowers every day. Now, where are you? No one's saying that. The style of violins these days is, is very much as it was in Strauss time, which is um, four corners, traditional scroll, brown. I just felt when I started making violins that there was, you know, no need for it to stay like that, really and um, so had some fun developing some different shapes. Then exactly to tears I did cry One for each life I make stuff according to tradition and using traditional ingredients, uh, but I'm very happy and, and enjoy making it look different, sound different, feel different, I suppose in a way Pat surprised us with her music. And she'll take tradition and she will uh, use it and modify it in a way that she feels is interesting. But she's always honest to the tradition within that. See you in a mirror, you are laughing at your looks. They take up your time, right honey you. Life sings funny songs and will caress your golden head. And I did too You can curse me for the fool that I am still Oh, where are you? It feels as though you will How the rain came down Not outside, but inside then exactly to tears I did cry How the rain came down Not outside but inside And then exactly to tears I cry Like all musicians, Eliza Carthy spends the majority of her time on the road. She does this really funny thing. She's, she's always done it, of getting to a hotel room and you'd be in the travel lodge one night and then you'd be in the, you know, whatever it is, on the motorway the next night. And she'll always get all of her stuff out. Even though we'll be there for one night, she'll get all of her bits out. Put all of her shampoos and little hair clips and her funny little creatures that she carries around with her. I think that's her way of trying to make some sort of environment and home feeling for herself. Eliza grew up in a home full of musicians. Her father, Martin, is only part of the musical dynasty she's from. Norma, her mother, is one of the pioneers of English traditional music. Along with sister Lal, brother Mike and cousin John, Norma was part of one of the best-known singing groups of the 1960s. They sing in folk clubs all over the country. They travel around in an old van. They positively shun the limelight. These are the Watersons, a very important part of the revival of traditional British music. We had never, ever intended that that should be our career, really. We, had, we just fell into it. It was a complete accident. Mostly, that was our hobby. Mostly, that was our love, and we just wanted to learn about this wonderful music that was ours and teach it to other people. Singing's always been fun. That was the beginning of the end as far as we were concerned, singing uh, and travelling and earning not a lot, great deal of money. We were doing what we wanted to do. When first snow and so we were thoroughly enjoying ourselves singing, which is, seems to be our life. The Watersons, um, were 
perhaps the premier um, uh, a cappella vocal group of the, of the folk revival. Sing! The three Watson children were orphans and they were from a gypsy background and they, they lived up in uh, sort of Yorkshire, Kingston upon Hull that way. And they just had this great fund of, of, of songs that they sang in these beautiful sort of chiming harmonies. The one thing that the Watersons are, above all else, is uh, they're intuitive musicians. And if you learn intuition in music, then you can sing with the Watersons. I remember feeling that the very first time I heard the three of them sing. I went up to Hull to sing, and that's when I first met Norma. And that's a story, too. <laughs> it's love at first sight. But um, uh, they, they then came down to London, and they sang at the Troubadour, and I introduced them, and they stood up, and they sang three score and ten, and my jaw hit the ground. It was just... Uh, there was nothing like them around at that time, nothing. Sing, walnut, sing, walnut, drive on, the lads drive on. Who wouldn't be for all the world and your leeward and Everyone has a soundtrack to their childhood, you know, me and my, me and my cousins and... My family and my aunties and my uncles and everything, and, and the, 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 the soundtrack to that is actually the sound of my family singing, you know, my family singing particular songs as well. Three children, Norma, Lal and Mike, each one of them musically a giant. Mike writes the most fabulous songs, the, of, a, sort of, of a narrative variety. Lal used to write the most fabulous songs of a lyrical variety. Norma's written one or two things, but she, she's a singer who can sing absolutely anything. And she's passed that on to Liza. I love making something just out of nothing. I love that. When you have the total freedom to do whatever you want, you know, you got a studio full of toys, <laughs> then it's, it's fantastic. I love going in with, with two or three lines in my head and making a complete song, you know. And then I love working on something in my head for months and months and months and months. Like, I mean, anybody that writes will tell you, sometimes it comes out all in one go, and then sometimes it comes out in lots of disparate ideas that, that one day you'll just be looking through your notebook and you'll just go, why did I never see that these things were exactly the same thing, that they're talking about the same thing, and you can put those things together and make, make them, you know, into a cohesive song. That happens a lot as well, you know, because you do return to, you return to personal themes, you return to things that you, you know, things that you just dwell on. The things that you dwell on are always the same at the end of the day. So sometimes you can have some things that you've written like a year apart, a verse here and a verse there, and you suddenly realise that they're perfect for each other as verses, or one of them's perfect for the chorus and that, that kind of thing. I'm like little scraps of paper, you know, little lines in my head. She's always written poetry. She always wrote. I mean, she would, uh, you know, when she was eight or nine, she used to write really pretty stuff. Um, she writes very much like her auntie Lal. Lal Waterson, Eliza's aunt, is one of the great English songwriters. In 1998, Lal died of cancer aged 55. Sleeping in my blood. Al well, Waters, I think, was um, one of the greatest songwriters this country has produced in the last 50 years. She wrote some amazing songs that had seemed to have no, nothing um, to do with any other songwriter. It seemed to come from nowhere except her own imagination, a very fertile imagination, and, again, rooted in, in the countryside, the geography of Yorkshire. Rain pours and the wind rolls. Fine, fine, horse, fine. 
her songs were not particularly about one thing. She wrote several songs with bits of, you know, bits about the sea, bits about the, the you know, the, the weather and things like that. Her songs were quite obscure. Shades of yellow, shades of green. And people used to say, what does that mean? And she just said, does it have to mean anything? <laughs> Bloody annoying. <laughs> It was our bedtime if uh, Mike and Norma and they'd come round and sing in the front room and we used to sneak down and sit at the bottom of the stairs and listen. And uh, we had a few sing songs here and my kids were sat at the bottom of the stairs sneaking and listening too, so it was uh, a rite of passage. The thing, the thing about Eliza with regards to the, to the Watsons is, you've got to remember, none of the Watsons play violin. And Eliza's violin playing and what she does with it and how she pitches it and where it begins and ends is a, a marvel to me because it never begins where I think it's going to begin, it never goes where I think it's going to go and it never ends where I expect it's going to end. remember just one time she, there's a song of hers that just every time she does it well there's a few songs of hers that do that to me but there's one in particular because it was the it was the, the first one that um, completely blew me out of my chair she it seemed to have come from nowhere and of course it hadn't she'd been working on it. it's a thing called uh, um, made lamenting piece of playing and singing and she sings it once in a while I just, if we're doing when we did a gig together and Norma couldn't do it I sort of she said what's that doing I said I ain't lamenting I haven't done it for ages don't care <laughs> so she did it and it's just utterly riveting and I will never forget the first time she did it in public it was at a festival just a, a little village festival just south of Bristol and I can't remember the name of the place delightful place and there was this uh, Lovely old bloke who was looking after us, and uh, he sat. He sat in the front row when uh, when we were doing the gig, and he really adored Liza. And uh, he was such. He was a lovely old man. And he sat there, and she picked up the fiddle, and she went to play by herself. And you could see him set set back in his chair and think, "Oh, she's my favourite, and now she's going to sing me a song." And he sat back, and she sang this song, and it went straight to his heart. You could see him; it completely broke him up. He was absolutely thunderstruck. At this woman, and so so with Norma and I, she, she finished and just went, "Holy shit!" <laughs> oh, just she is an extraordinary musician, and. Uh, She's got a, got a way of going straight to the heart of something, just, just like her mum. Yeah, come on, come on, chat me down. Yeah. Can we do the um, same as last time? Uh, yeah, I think so. You don't want to do two tiers? Yeah, well, I think we should actually have a go at two tiers tonight, to be honest. It's, um... Yeah, no, I've always done it. After travelling 200 miles from North London, Eliza is back in Yorkshire, at Leeds City Varieties, one of England's oldest musicals. To 
see her play live, the physicality of her playing. Like she's stomping the floor while she's playing and she's just striding the stage like she's playing lead guitar, whirling around like a, like a Yorkshire dervish. She's a great singer, she's a great fiddle player. She's got a great bunch of friends around her who form groups, you know. It's a continuation of us, but her way is probably a little bit faster than I would like it, basically because the lungs are buggered. <laughs> I saw Eliza play the fiddle and she was really kind of blazing away in it and you think, I hadn't seen that much, certainly I hadn't seen many women doing it. And um, again I think that it, it sort of takes the instruments and the tradition forward to a whole new generation. <laughs> there are people, I think particularly when you're young you have energy and it's like natural if you get on a stage with excitement and energy, it's, it's natural to move. It's natural to kind of want to stand up and give it some, you know. I think that why she's an artist is because you get the feeling that she would do what she does, whether there's an audience for it or not. She's clearly someone that loves that music and is driven by it. People from the English folk tradition are really excited to have as persuasive an advocate as Eliza Carthy arguing the case for English folk music. But I think that that's kind of secondary to her as an artist. She just feels driven to create. Your bosom were a glass, a glass So I could view it through and through I just to view the secrets of your heart If I love one, 
I can't love to Willow Tree is a version of a song Eliza found on an old Topic Records compilation of English folk tunes. What has happened over the years is it's gone down from father to son and mother to daughter all the way down through the years, through the years, changed. You know, somebody heard it in, I don't know, Norwich and went off and lived in to Leeds, took the song with them, and so you get a different version. You get, you know, and this is how all the different versions be, uh, uh, arrive because people, you know, people don't remember them exactly right. In 1965, an elderly woman named Mae Bradley sang Willow Tree in a pub called the Blue Boar. As I pass by a willow tree, willow tree, that willow leaves Things as low as I do. <laughs> By reinterpreting this old song, Eliza has brought Mae Bradley and her world back to life, as vividly as any photograph or memento. I've listened to certain songs all my life, and she will get the song and she will sing it, and you, she puts something into it that you think, oh, God, why didn't I see that? You know, oh, yes, that, yeah, that, that's right, it's, it's right. When I listen to it, I could really hear that that sort of 30s, 40s kind of swing thing in there. The tune's still really different, isn't it? You'll take my hand, but not my hand. If I approach a song, the first thing that I do is find, try and find a traditional singer who sings that song. I want to know what they do with it. I want to hear how they feel. And the only way you're going to do that is by hearing a traditional singer. The internet has made finding hidden gems like this easier than ever before. But without musicians like Eliza Carthy to sing them, a part of English heritage would disappear forever. Oh, give me back to the one I love, I love. I think Eliza is really good at taking old songs by, by the horns and, and dragging them to, to another place where you hadn't thought about them. These songs were originally written by somebody, the idea of the song. If we don't sing them and if we don't do anything with them, it won't be there, which is a really, you know, it's, a very, it's a big shame and a sad thing. As Eliza's dad, Martin Carthy, is very fond of saying, you know, the worst thing you can do with a traditional song is to ignore it and not play it. And I think that's spot on. If I only...